What's up everybody? Today's video is about spirometry, specifically in the doctor's offices. So I've been asked to do a presentation uh, to some medical assistants and nurses that may be doing spirometry in the some rural physician offices, uh, provider offices. Um, and so I'm going over the basics of things that you need to know to get reproducible loops and to get a good study on spirometry. So are you ready? Here it goes. All right, so spirometer, this is the one that you guys have. It is kind of the baseline. You have a program in your computer, in the computer, you plug this in. Um, this piece right here is disposable. That comes sealed, so it's a one-time use thing. Very easy, they make these things super simple so you can't mess them up. There's three holes there. There's three nubs, two are next to each other. You look at the holes next to each other, these go in that it goes over clips the cool thing about this is you got some cord so you're gonna let the patient hold it because they're gonna have to blow into it and so they'll want to hold it now you'll also notice definitely they couldn't buy see they made it short so they couldn't blow on this side because this is the wrong side so and then if you ever see these little ridges that's for like people's teeth to kind of grab onto it <laughs> if they have them. so um, so we uh, we plug, we plug it in, and the first part that it may ask you to do is do a calibration. Calibration is very, very easy, and it's, you, we use this three, M, three liter syringe. So this is exactly three liters in here, okay? It has a cap on it, and the machine will talk you through every bit of this. Now, I, I did talk to the one of the practice uh, managers, and I said I, she didn't know what the frequency of doing the calibration is so it might be once a month might be once a week might be once a day might be for every test extremely easy they'll tell you on the screen what to do this is just a big plunger but it's exactly measured out three liters this thing goes on here if you plugged in you would go through a calibration on the computer and then would probably ask you to open it all the way up until it stops close it down open it up you close it down and that will probably be it that's calibration. So it's just checking to make sure that when this says three liters, it's going through here, going to the computer saying three liters. How in the heck does it do that? Well, it's really cool how it works. There's like a little honeycomb down the center there. And so the changes in flow and the pressure as it goes through there, that's how they get all the numbers. So it's, it's pretty technical, although it looks kind of El Cheapo, it actually is pretty technical. So after we get that done, it's time to do the spirometry. So I always recommend that the patient holds it. And so you hand it to them. This is yours to hold while we do the spirometry and you're the coach. So you're gonna coach them through it. A second aspect of this is to, what's really important and they're gonna work on this is getting a set of nose clips. And I'll show you when we go downstairs and do it, why you need nose clips. Because what we're gonna have, have them do, if I have them breathe on this, and they're not nose breather at all, you lose all your air. Right? So the only way to get really, really accurate test is to have the nose, uh, nose clipped. So those are usually disposable, use them just one time. So to do a fourth vital capacity, so we've got these two things we're gonna look at here. Fourth vital capacity and FEV1, forced expiratory volume in the first second. Just let's make it super easy because I have some pictures here to make it very easy. So let's say that Chelsea, that your force vital capacity is this area right here. Okay, that's how much air you should be able to exhale by going all the way in and then from this point all the way out till totally empty. Okay, so top end to the bottom totally empty. That's force vital capacity. That's the full amount. If you, t if you go through this appropriately with them, they should have reproducible, and I'll talk about this a lot, reproducible force vital capacity. So if I have you do three of them, they should all be pretty close to the same. They should be different. If you're going all the way until you're full and you fully exhale, it should be the same. It's really good to tell the patients too, this is not a normal breath. So this is not like just, or that's not it. Not it. This is, this is gonna feel uncomfortable for you to take that breath all the way in. 
it's all the way up, and you notice on my chest even kind of goes, that's how you can tell they're giving good effort. And then it's a black, get every bit of air out. Because it needs to be 10, it really needs to be 15 seconds. We're gonna say 10 to 15. 10 to 15 seconds of exhalation for it to be an adequate test. So what we're gonna look at, and they'll look, at some, they'll look something like this. So I'll try to count to make sure I get it all in. So you can ask me to take my big deep breath and blast it out, I'm gonna go in. And I breathed back through that. I didn't breathe back through it really well. But you can tell I ran out of air really fast. What? But you have, you can't just make them run out of air and stop. They've got to keep pushing. And there's actually a counter, I'm sure there is on your computer too, to see 10 to 15 seconds of exhalation. So it's really important to do that. So if I do Chelsea's and her FVC is below her predicted, which means 80% or below, that means she has some kind of restrictive lung disorder. She doesn't have as much volume as she should, right? It makes sense. So how do they know what your normal volume is? Go by a couple different things. Male or female, height, and age. Now, weight's not calculated in there, right? I'm a towering five foot five, so it wouldn't matter if I was five foot five, 120 pounds, or five foot five and 320. My thoracic cavity is the same size. So if there is a five foot five woman, same age as me next to me, my predicted would be just a smidge higher just because males are built with a little wider chest cavity. So perfectly normal. So those are important data and it says that on here, very important data, weight, height. Uh, so you measure weight, right? So weight is not that big of a deal. If they can estimate it, that's, that's okay. But Height is very important because weight doesn't have a lot to do with height does. Male or female, they say birth sex on there. I think that's what they're using now. So anyway, so you'll have to put that in. The computer will give you predicted values. What you really want them to get is 80% or higher if they can. Now, if they can't, you just want three reproducible tests. Well, what does reproducible mean? That means that everything that all these different volumes like let's say force volume capacity let's say your predicted chelsea is 2.3 liters what they say is if you do three of them we want them all within 150 milliliters so if it's 2.3 and you have to get one that's 2.2 and one that's 2.5 that's all within 150 milliliters right so we'll look at that on the on the machine downstairs so that's what we're looking at with that that's reproducible the flow is, is really important too. So if your force volume capacity is good, which means you don't have a restrictive lung disorder, but for normal, for normal lungs, you're supposed to get 70% of that air out of your lungs in one second. So of your total amount of air, you should get 70% out in one second. That's what your, uh, your ratio looks at, but that also looks at your flow, your speed that you're blowing out. So if you can't get the air out, like if this does not get up to the top here, your ratio is going to be off, but then your flow is going to be off. So you have a predicted flow also. And that flow, the speed that air comes out, that's what I try to tell the patients. We're measuring speed. Get it out fast. Don't hold it till the end. Get it out fast. That's going to tell us about obstruction to flow. So then we take those two numbers, we put them together, and then that's when we're saying we need to get 70% of it out in the total amount of time. So those are the three things we document. FVC, FEV1, FVC, FEV1 ratio. So in this case, let's say your FVC is great, your FEV1 is low, and it calculates the ratio for you, and your ratio is 50%. Um, so you could only get, of your FVC, only 50% of it was FEV1. Well, that's not good, right? Because your flow was low, so you probably have some kind of obstructive disorder. So we treat those different than we would treat a restrictive disorder. Restrictive disorder is something like a pneumonia, something like if you had a, a chunk of lung removed, if you have a pleural effusion, restrictive disorder. Anything that's gonna cause your lung capacity to be smaller. With obstructive disorders, you usually have a big lung capacity, but it's just dysfunctional. It doesn't flow well out of there. So another test that you might do, which I don't think you guys will do, but you could do, is we do this FBC, get the numbers, give somebody a breathing treatment, wait 10 minutes and do it again. 
And then what actually that tells us is it's really cool. You'll actually see the FEB1 change if the breathing treatment works. So their flows will get faster. And if they get 12% faster, it is a black and white indication that they need breathing treatments. So I don't know how many patients you've seen before that say, my doctor put me on these breathing treatments, but they don't do much for me. I always like doing this with it because I'm like, okay, well, let's see if it's actually doing anything in there. Most of the time it's not. As a review, we look at three different things. FEV1, forced expiratory volume in the first second, that tells us about obstruction. FVC, which is the full capacity and the ratio, and all that stuff is given to you super easy. And we were going through the uh, procedure for doing the breath. It's gonna be a maximum breath in, and I'll show you. And since you came in a little late, we'll, we'll do a, I'll have you do it on me downstairs, just so you can show me, how, you can coach me. It's all about coaching and knowing and making a reproducible test. Um, so there's, there is some confusion about spirometry versus PFTs. So PFTs, usually when, you, when you're talking about that, that's pulmonary function testing, and usually we're talking about a full pulmonary function test. There's a ton of tests that we do with that, which takes like 30 minutes to 40 minutes. Spirometry is just this one forced vital capacity, this FVC, that one blast. So okay. spirometry is a much, it's not a PFT. Okay. This is spirometry and it's a smaller area. That makes more sense. Yeah, so when you say PFT, I mean, a lot of people think, oh, we call it a full PFT, but it takes a long time and there's a lot of special breathing and I'll show you on the machine downstairs. There's a lot of kind of funky stuff you do with it and you gotta know when to hit press the button and when not. This is very easy. This is just a force vital capacity. You just gotta know how to tell a patient to do that. And that's the coaching that you have to do. Um, and I think that is probably it. Now over time, this ratio here, that I talked about the FEV1 to FEC ratio, it will go down because your lung can become less elastic. And then, so you won't be able to get the air out quite as fast. We understand that after 60, your <clears throat> ratio goes down. But like I was, telling, I was telling them earlier, your spirometry is just like you're taking somebody's heart rate or blood pressure. Everybody's could be different at a different point, but you need to have serial numbers to look at a trend. And that's really what spirometry is. It's just like another vital sign that we do once a year just to see a trend in their lungs. Just taking one at a time doesn't do much because heart rates can be different. But if you have something to compare it to, like, a year ago, they had this for their spirometry, and then now they have this for their spirometry. We can say, same, better, or worse. Is the medication working? Well, what's the change in their spirometry? Okay. So that's why I really see that, um, and I was saying that doing this in the office and doing training for this is like so important, and I'm, I applaud you guys for coming to this because you will know more than 90% of people that are doing this in the office. I've seen crazy stuff. Just, you know, it's just like one of those tasks kind of thing, right? You know, you got this task, check, 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 do spirometry. <sighs> I don't know if you're having to do three, but I mean, you're having them blow in or whatever it is, but it's like a task. Okay, write the numbers down. But if we do it really, really well, then um, we can use it. It's a really good tool. So, um, and also it's a billable service. And so it's, it is a, it's a, it's a good billable service. Insurance companies know that if physicians are looking at these and providers are looking at these, they can manage their disease better, therefore keep them out of the hospital and keep them at home and medicate them in the proper way for the medications they need. So the last thing I'll talk about before we go downstairs, there's a lot of medications that can affect this, uh, mainly at bronchodilators. So we're talking about albuterol, Zopinex. Those are the fast acting bronchodilators. And if they've taken one of those in the last four hours where they came in, they may have, they may have, I would call juiced. <laughs> they may have a uh, little higher numbers than what they should. Just document that. If they took their uh, albuterol inhaler on the way in today, just document that albuterol inhaler on the way in, just so that you know. So if we look at it last year compared to this year, we know that they took their albuterol inhaler. So if it's a little lower, maybe that's the reason. There's a ton of respiratory medications now. There's Fast acting bronchodilators, there's double co there's combo medications like Simbacor, Advair, that have a long acting bronchodilator and then a steroid in it. And now there's a triple combo like Trilogy that has long, long acting bronchodilator, steroid, long acting um, anticholinergic agent, kind of like a Spiriva in it. So you've got these 
Tons of different medications. If they have respiratory medications, I should have put that on the list. Write that on their doc documentation. This is what they're on. And if you don't know how to spell it, which I don't know how to spell the majority of them anymore, I just Google them. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's nice to know what kind of medication it is because that will affect it. So if they just got started on Spreva and um, they got started two months ago, this would be nice to show that they've been on Spreva for, for two months to see if it's done anything. Just a, a review of what med the medications do. So uh, bronchodilators, what they do, so beta agonists, they go in, the muscles surround the airways, they bind to the muscles and they cause them to loosen up. That's how they open up the airways. Steroids go into inflammation, not the muscles, bind to the inflammation and cause the airway lumen to get larger. That works well too. The anticholinergics, the atrovent, the spiriva, uh, teatropium, that kind of stuff, what it does, it works with the albuterol or the bronchodilator and keeps the airways open longer. So the cholinergic response of the body is for the airways just to close back down. Well, anticholinergic will keep them open longer. So your bronchodilator goes in, like your albuterol, loosens the muscles, and then you're also giving the anticholinergic too, which keeps them open longer. So if somebody's on duoneb, that's albuterol and atrovent. So it's better than just giving out butyrol by itself because it goes in, it opens them, and then it keeps them from closing back down for a longer period of time. So not a lot of, respiratory farm is very easy. It's really built around three medications. So there's some other funky stuff, but it's, it's not hard if you understand how they work. Then, uh, it, but, but it's all really good to document when you're doing uh, any kind of spirometry. Questiones. Awesome. Well, let's go downstairs. And we'll do some demos. Nope. Okay, so we're going to do this force vital capacity. We already have some numbers here, as you can see. She's already met it on these three dark check marks. We actually have a, a full check mark, so we have three reproducible. And we're going to do one more with Nicole here, with me coaching her how to go through this. So. All right, are you ready? Uh -huh. So Nicole, you're gonna breathe normal. Nose clips on, everything's good. So she's breathing normal. All right, whenever you're ready, I want you to take a big deep breath in and blast it out. Big, now blast. Blah, 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 keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Three, two, one, big breath in. Good oh. job, good job. It's so long. <laughs> All right. So the last one was very good, actually better than the other ones. 4.19, 3.38, and FVC of 90, 81% when the predicted is 82. So we did four reproducible values there which is extra good and we would report that bottom one out and say that we had three reproducibles on top of it so great job and three stars it's hard to get all right cool great job nicole thank you <laughs>